being human. Does anyone object to what I'm advocating for? I'm advocating for being human. But of course no one's going to object to that. So if I know that already, then why am I here? And what insights do I think I can tell you about being human, or why I think I need to advocate for it? Well, let me start with why me. Um, in order to tell you who I am, I need to start by telling you first about my best friend, Kelly. Um, today, December 1st, was supposed to be Kelly's 37th birthday, um, but she died uh, three weeks ago. And uh, Kelly and I met uh, 20 years ago when I was 16 years old, and we met at a summer program which was one of those mock government type things. Um, and one of the things that Kelly and I really bonded over was that we thought it was a little ridiculous and weird. And um, the premise of it being that it was a bunch of teenage girls running around, running for mock government um, and promising, uh, running for elections for state mock government positions and running on fake platforms. And so it really bothered us, and we would talk about this a lot, that they would, um, that the candidates would promise things like that they would cure cancer or that they would solve the world hunger problem. And it just didn't make sense to us, and so instead we spent that week um, becoming friends. And what really made that um, friendship, what makes that friendship special to me is that Kelly really, uh, saw me and she saw my humanity and she understood me at a time, well always, but in that time in my life where I really felt disconnected and alone and that I didn't really belong and she saw my humanity. And so that didn't all happen in one week. <clears throat> what did happen was we went home to our respective towns in New Jersey and um, we didn't have the internet back then. It was 1993. So I couldn't get online and send her an email or about how great she was or uh, text her. And so instead what I did was I wrote Kelly a letter. And I um, thought that letter was just so deep and profound, <laughs> even though it really wasn't. But I, I thought it was. And so I went to the, before mailing it to her, I went to the public library and I photocopied it. And I put it in a journal, or in this, a notebook, this style notebook exactly, um, that my father had given me. And um, that became the beginning of journals that I ca I've kept since then. And it all began with, the words, Dear Kelly. And when I say, Dear Kelly, um, I'm connecting to a part of my humanity that is open and true. Um, and then I have to tell you about my brother, Alex. And Alex is 26 years old, and he cannot speak. And he has never been able to speak. He's a fierce warrior himself. He's, he, uh, imagine, I just want you to take a second to imagine spending your entire life never speaking, trapped in your mind and not having the language to communicate. Um, your soul more or less locked inside. And Alex has since figured out ways to communicate through typing, which is a different story, but the reason I, have, I bring up Alex is because in order for you to understand who I am and why I care about humanity and connecting to humanity and communicating, and um, you have to understand how much I care for and love my brother, Alex. Uh, so when I say being human, I mean <clears throat> connecting to a part of myself that is open and raw and true, where ego doesn't matter, and where the broader human race does. So as a statistician, how do I find ways to engage with that humanity? Um, so when I graduated from college, uh, I, had, I, I went, Kelly and I ended up going to college together, and we, um, I, stud she didn't, I studied pure math, and, or theoretical math. And when I graduated, I um, 
had this idea that I really wanted to find ways to use math to solve real world problems. Um, but, and I think this is connected to being a woman in math. And uh, this isn't a scientific study. This is just based anecdotally on my personal experience as well as conversations I've had recently with other women in math. Um, we really want to be able to use math to, to affect change in the world. Um, so being a woman in math or being a human in math or being me in math, I wanted to solve problems that would help people. And, um, but back then, it wasn't really obvious to me how to go about doing that, even though I knew that's what I wanted. And a lot has changed in the world since then, 15 years ago and now, which makes a lot of difference for a quantitatively minded person who really wants to solve real world problems. And that difference is um, that back then we didn't have nearly as much data about humans as we have today. And so the question is why? Technology. So when I graduated, Google didn't exist yet. Um, Yahoo did, um, but the internet was just in its early stages and uh, we didn't use cell phones. And so in the past 15 years, our lives have gone from offline to online. And so we do lots, we live lots of our life out online. Um, we search for information online, we search, look for directions of where to go, we find movie music recommendations, we find people to date, to love, to marry, we read, we tweet, we watch YouTube videos, and all of this creates data about us humans. And that data can be used to better understand human behavior. Um, but it's not just internet data that we have. We have now have data about finance and government, and we have data about uh, education and social welfare. So we've, across all these sectors, we have data. And so human civilization now has access to massive amounts of data, and simultaneously we have the inexpensive computing power that can be used to process and analyze that data. And so the job of someone like me or someone who handles massive amounts of data is we do things like we write computer code that can and, and build machine, what are called machine learning algorithms that can automatically detect and find patterns in that data. And so, for example, think about Netflix. There's not just a, a human, like a single person going through by hand and saying, well, I think this person would like this and I should recommend this movie to that person. It's an algorithm that figured out the whole thing and is automatically figuring out what movies or, to recommend, or TV shows to recommend people. And that alone takes a lot of, um, the, the algorithms may not be perfect, but they're constantly being improved upon, and they, it requires a lot of creativity and human ingenuity to, to do that. Um, but on top of that, or even maybe more importantly, <clears throat> the computer does not have curiosity about data. And the computer is not able to ask questions about data, and it can't find meaning in it or interpret the meaning in it. You need humans to do that. And a computer is not capable of evaluating the ethical implications <clears throat> of auto automatically uh, a financial algorithm that automatically trades, or of a statistical model that determines who's going to get health care or who should not get health care, and the risks or the impacts of, on potential human life. You need humans to do that. And governments and corporations are only are increasing, uh, only increasing the, their resources that they're putting into their data infra infrastructure. And so we're only in the future going to have more and more data. And so it's crucial that the right people are handling that data. And so that's where the class that I am teaching comes in. I'm educating a new generation of problem solvers to figure out ways to handle that data responsibly and to, to solve problems with that data. And import, most importantly, to bring their humanity with them, their integrity, their intuition, and their curiosity, their ethics. Um, the students are coming from across the university. Um, they're scientists of all types, from urban planning, um, political scientists, sociologists, bioinformatics, and these students are thinking about how they are going to solve real-world problems with data. 
And so, and their, their models and algorithms can literally change the world. They're going to be built back into the fabric of our society. And so that's a lot of responsibility. The types of algorithms that they're building or credit, credit scoring models or uh, models that can predict the spread of disease or whether who, who's going to get, predict whether someone gets cancer or not. And so that's a lot of responsibility and it takes ethics, ingenuity, and intuitiveness. And, but on top of that, I need to tell you that in order for me to teach this class effectively, and in order for me to feel like I was really connecting to my students, I had to find a way to bring my humanity to them and in a way that I felt was professional but also sincere. And the way I went about this was I started a blog, and I begin many of my blog entries with Dear Students. Um, dear students, dear students, dear Kelly, dear students, and by doing this I can connect to my humanity and I can express the way that I see things. And so what is advocacy? Advocacy is speaking up. And so what am I advocating for? I'm advocating for a world that engages and sees its humanity a world that tries to connect and tries to find ways to take away the pain of being alone, and also a world that uh, educates people to use data to solve human problems, and a world where data is used to improve the world. Um, am I naive or overly optimistic or idealistic? No, I'm a scientist. But I knew Kelly and I know Alex, and their existence on Earth is an existence proof, which is a mathematical term, proof that being human is worth advocating for. Thank you. Mm -hmm.